And for a certain period of time, we've shut off this relationship to the cosmos as though it were a living, spiritual thing and are just looking at it according to the laws of physicality, and we've imposed something called celestial mechanics. It's inertia, it's gravity, it's these forces that we can describe through physics that make all of this move. It's not a community. The Earth isn't in a relationship with the sun that says, I'm gonna move like this. And yet, if you look a little bit further, you can find out, at least in anthroposophy, that Rudolf Steiner continually introduced ideas that would support this thought, that this is a living environment. There's a motto for social ethic. A healthy social life is found when in the, I might say it backward, but I'll get it out there. When in the individual soul, the community finds its reflection, and when in the community, the virtue of each one is living. So this is a relationship between community and individual, and it's a mutual relationship. Community is made up of individuals that share something, and the individual is not just consumed by community, but the individual has to have selfhood as well. This really, if you kind of dust it off, is standing on the idea about our planetary system that comes from Johannes Kepler. Kepler came after Copernicus, and he was a heliocentrist, believed that the planets were moving around the sun, and he described it that, okay, no, they're not moving in circles around the sun, they're moving in ellipses. So the planetary bodies move in ellipses around a central body, but that body is at one of the focal points of the ellipse, not right at the center of the ellipse. And that the orbiting body, as it's moving around that central body, there's a radius vector, mathematical term. That radius vector is continually <coughs> altered. This is an implied relationship between Earth, at least the, the orbiting body and the thing that it's orbiting. It's not just circling where there's no consciousness required, but that step by step there's awareness of where that is relative to what's moving. This is at the foundation of this model for social ethic. You could say the sun is the community within which the virtue of each one is living, and that the planets are the individuals that would reflect the image of that community to itself. So this is a concept that we hold about the construct of our planetary system upon which we stand to create communities and to live in community life, as above, so below. But we're bringing it out of ourselves, we're not standing beneath it and letting it, it dictate to us, but we're trying to unfold it. And our idea about the construction of this planetary system changes <coughs> over time just as our communities change and our idea about community life. And if through light pollution and light trespass we're cutting off our access to that larger community, it gets more and more challenging to find harmonious community expression here. I was in Milwaukee recently and I was sharing this story on the way here that it's a Lake Michigan coastal community and I live in northern Michigan on the coast of Lake Michigan. And I made the naive assumption that, okay, it's a Lake Michigan community. Well, an East Coast Lake Michigan community is quite a bit different from a West Coast Lake Michigan community. The East Coast has the dawn. There's a lot of social activism in Milwaukee. Where I live, we have sunset and dusk. It's all about end of day, resort, relaxation, totally different mood. And I walked into this environment and Whoa, I had no idea. I thought Lake Michigan. I didn't think sunrise, sunset. But these are things that influence the, the, the area, with the geographic location where we find ourselves. Am I oriented towards sunrise? Am I oriented towards sunset? Maybe I'm lucky and I get both. But if you look geographically where you're situated, when I first got here, I don't know if Tomas is in the room, I had been traveling for several hours, starting at 3 a.m. I got here, it was probably about 9.30, and we were standing over by the registration room, and the sun was not that high. It wasn't noon yet, so it wasn't directly overhead, so in my inner picture, it was about southeast. And Tomas said, and that way is south, but he was pointing toward the sun, and I had this really funny look on my face, and he said, 
are you directionally challenged? <laughs> I said, no, but you just kind of made me, forced me into this gesture in my inner picture of where I am right now that doesn't fit. Because I'm wanting the sun to be southeast, and you just said that that was due south, and I don't get it. It doesn't feel like it to me. And I'm really sensitive to, and I, I didn't know this always, I'll be 50 this year, I have not always known that I've got this picture of the environment that I'm in, but we each of us are carrying a picture, even though we're not thinking about it. We look at a clock, and that clock is an hour off, which is really disconcerting. <laughs> but we have a sense of time of day, that's measuring the position of the sun and the horizon for us. And one of the ways, if you have you ever used a sextant, do you know what a sextant is? Mm -hmm. So it's this mechanism where you have a filter and you look toward the sun. First you identify a point on the horizon, and then you look at the sun and you turn a dial and the sun drops to the point that you've identified on the horizon. Then you look at the side of this mechanism, and depending on how many degrees you had to turn the dial to get the sun to hit the horizon, you can figure out where you are. This was used in early navigation. Well, if you ever do this, it's a remarkable experience. Summer solstice a couple years ago, so a friend of mine said, come on, Mayor, we're going to go out and look at this sextant. I'm going to show you how to use it and give you some of the math, which I'm not a math person. <laughs> and so I looked through. I was really excited to look at it. I got the sun, and I had my point on the horizon. I turned the dial. And, Whoa! I just moved the sun in my being. Not out there, the sun was still where it was, but I awakened to this inner sense of my environment. And it's not easy to find those experiences. I have a relationship to where the sun is. I don't even need to know how many miles away it is. But it's somewhere in my sense of myself on the earth. This is a real thing. It's not out there, it's in here. In, in this, I hope that doesn't sound really abstract or really fluffy. It's a real experience. And trying to understand that outer relationship strengthens an inner capacity. This is the idea that comes from Rudolf Steiner. When we study the starry world and try to make ourselves conversant with the constellations of the zodiac, the rhythm of the motion of the planets, it strengthens us as human beings. It's nourishing us in that place, that source, that belongs to what we brought with us. The human being stands as a mediator between the celestial cosmos and the earth. And our task, at least to the degree that we've taken up anthroposophy and spiritual science as a stream of practice, the task is to recognize when does the earth want to know about the cosmos and when does the cosmos want to know about the earth. In the course of the cycle of the year, we can see that the sun is uppermost at summer solstice, so there's more emphasis on that celestial world. And at winter solstice, it's kind of gone from our view in the northern hemisphere, so the emphasis is on Earth. And I'm mediating between that with my consciousness. And from my perspective, as someone who is not a farmer, but nowhere can you give more practical application of that than in farming. We're doing something that is very dependent on the cycle of the year. And knowing when the growth forces are showing up and trying to recognize, did something just shift this weekend? Did it change? Is there something going on that I can sense and can I come into relationship with that? Not take advantage of it, but come into relationship with it. So that I understand that it's not just, it, it is a miracle. And it's not just a miracle. It's a cycle of becoming that we are totally immersed in. Okay, I'm going to step back over here to this machine and see what the next image is. <laughs> it will be as much of a surprise for me as it is for you. <laughs> ...would take place in the universe. Rhythm holds sway through all of nature. The violet and the lily bloom at the same time each year. Animals have their regular rutting times. But... When we reach the human level, things look rather different. The rhythm, which through the course of the year holds sway in growth, propagation, and so forth of plant and animal worlds, ceases when we come to the human being. Our potential for freedom 
means that the more highly civilized we are, the more this rhythm declines. We can stay up really late at night with the lights on. You don't have to be governed by the waxing and waning of the moon, the rising and setting of the sun. We've created artificial light to illuminate our world so we can do stuff at night. But what's starting to happen is we're learning that yeah, it's not such a good idea to be exposed to artificial light at night. There's research being done now that demonstrates how this art exposure to artificial light at night interferes with the production of melatonin. And there is a link being seen between in women in particular who work the night shift and an increase in breast cancer. And the research that's being done now is looking at is this because of the exposure to light at night which interferes with the production of melatonin. <coughs> so we're starting to learn that okay, yeah, it was great that we could do this. We could ramp up our productivity because we can extend the hours of the day with this artificial light, but it's not necessarily a healthy thing for us to do that. And the further and further we reach into space, into deep space, it seems like we're losing more and more darkness here on the Earth. We've lit it all up. So as a dark sky advocate, the work is to kind of turn those lights down. And it's not even just completely turning them off, but turning it down, capping the light, focusing it on the thing that needs to be illuminated, and only using the amount of light that's needed. In the United States, I think it's the statistic, I'm not good at memorizing statistics, but it's like a third of the light that is used to illuminate the night is wasted because it's spilling upward. If you do the math and figure out how much that is, it costs about $2.2 billion a year to spill light up where it's not needed. What a waste. We are digging resources out of the earth to generate energy and then just tossing it away. We don't have to do that. And I don't think it was with malicious intention that the light was created to do that. It's that there wasn't a lot of thinking about it. In Michigan, Henry Ford is a big deal. You know, he, 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 the assembly line was the thing that he created. It's an opportunity for the human being to stand in one place and do one thing for a long time. And he was friends with Thomas Edison. So if you go to the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, which every person in <coughs> Asian countries that is involved in the automotive industry, they come to Michigan and they go to the Henry Ford Museum. This is part of their research. It's a real thing. And it's a big deal. How many of you have been to the Henry Ford Museum? It's really quite an experience to go there. So they have this marvelous exhibit about early aviation <coughs> and the beginning of flight. And they show how there were races at the beginning to see who could get to their destination fastest. And these really courageous pilots would start to take off at night. Well, then they had to figure out how they could see where they were going, and they would make deal with farmers along the way to put up a big pole, shine a light up so they could see where they were. We still do that, but we don't need that technology anymore. We don't have to rely on looking at the ground, we being the aviators, to look at the ground to find the way. We've got this radar and these other technologies, but the light is still there, and in in the dark sky world, we call them barnyard lights. Those big lights that are just spilling light out all over the place. That Maybe it's used to illuminate the area, but it's also spilling up into the night sky. And it's being wasted. So there's something called a Hubble sky cap. I'm just going to share this with you if you've got a barnyard light. It's not a very expensive piece of equipment. You just cap it on that light that takes all of it and sends it down. Night sky preservation is really satisfying work because the moment you cap the light or turn it off, the stars come right back. It's not like a forest that's been taken down and will take 100 years to be reestablished. The stars are there. I said this to Val, like a jilted lover waiting. <laughs> we don't speak their names. We don't necessarily know what their relationships are with one another. I had this amazing conversation with a radio broadcaster two weeks ago. It didn't occur to him that the stars that we recognize as making patterns 